Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are coming in from. It's good to have you here. Hi, I'm Larry Gifford. I am a member of the Michael J. Fox Foundation Parkinson's uh, Patient Council. And uh, this is the third Thursday webinar. Today we're going to talk about uh, telehealth. Uh, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's uh, five years ago at the age of 45. And um, I am the host of the podcast, When Life Gives You Parkinson's. And I co-founded the PD Avengers at pdavengers.com. It's great to be here uh, with you and with our panelists today. We're going to be discussing telehealth and the benefits of telehealth. It's a great option for people with Parkinson's. We'll cover access and availability of telehealth, uh, how to make the most of a virtual visit with your doctor. And uh, we'll also talk about the impacts of telehealth on research and care. This webinar is brought to you by Abbott Laboratories and uh, Eurocreen Biosciences. While their support helps make education programs possible, their donations do not influence foundation content or panelist selection. If you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box near the middle of your screen. Foundation staff and, and other panelists will get to as many as we can throughout the course of this hour that we have together. And if you want other helpful information and you want to download the slides, you can do that. Check the resource list on your screen. To put on captions in English, please click the CC button on the bottom right of the media player on your screen. And we've got a lot to discuss today, so I want to get started, but first let me introduce our panelists. First we have uh, Dr. Uh, Ramsey Falconer, uh, uh, and he is a, a movement disorder specialist, medical director of Inova Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Clinic. Uh, good, uh, good day, sir. Hello, hello. Good to have you here. We have uh, Dr. Jamie Martin. Uh, she's a movement disorder specialist and owner and consultant of Face-to-Face -face Neurology. Hello, uh, Dr. Martin. Hi, everyone. Good to see you, Larry. It's good to be seen. Good to be here. Uh, and we have uh, Ray Lapinus, board member and secretary of uh, NeuroBalance Center, NFP, also living with Parkinson's. Hello, Ray. Hello. How are you doing? Hi, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And next to you is Gail Lapinas, your your wife and uh, partner in Parkinson's. Hello, Gail. Thank you for having me. It's great. To, it's great to have you all here. Now, uh, Gail uh, and Ray are located in Illinois. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2017, and uh, he, uh, he he as I said, as a board member of the NeuroBalance Center (NFP), a wellness center designed for people with neurodegenerative diseases. And his wife, Gail, works as an executive at a major banking institution. Okay, so we have everybody's names down pat. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have name tags for everybody, so everybody just keep remembering who each other is. Okay? <laughs> We're going to get to a lot of great information here. The first is, what is telehealth? Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, if you could join me now and just give us a brief overview of what, what's all included in telehealth when we, when we yeah. use that term. Absolutely. So as many of you know, telehealth or telemedicine is a virtual way of communicating between you and your physician, your healthcare provider using technology such as phone or video. So this can include just your standard, you know, patient and physician evaluation to discuss your condition, discuss medications, recommendations, it can be used for education, um, interventions, and sometimes even remote monitoring. So maybe measuring tremors or falls, or in, you know, in, in other specialties, we might measure heart rhythms or your blood sugar remotely. And while many of us have been performing or doing telemedicine for quite some time, the COVID-19 pandemic vastly accelerated the implementation and the adoption of that. Um, and something that, you know, suddenly, something that only a small number of people were using became nearly universal because of the safety concerns, um, you know, related to the pandemic and that, that insurance was now covering all of these services for everyone. And that's a really interesting point. People have been doing this for quite a while. How many years back have you been uh, using telehealth? So uh, I first, it's very new to a lot of us. Yeah, so I first started around 2015, um, opened a movement disorders clinic for patients in the Atlanta area in 2016. Okay. And um, what do we know about telehealth? Ray and Gail, if you, if you can talk about your experiences with telehealth, and then we'll get to the doctor's perspective, but from a patient perspective and a care, care partner perspective, what, what's the experience been like for you? Actually, it was very helpful during COVID. Um, that was the first time I utilized telehealth for myself, and it just gave the access, especially living here in Chicago, Illinois, to get to my doctor's office. The 
travel time is over an hour, bad traffic there, bad traffic back. Um, you save money because there's no facility fee. I go to Rush Medical Center, and so that there's cost savings to it. So I've continued using telehealth, even though I can go to the doctor's office, just due to the convenience and the cost savings. And Gail, how, how have you found it uh, being there while he's uh, doing the uh, telemedicine? Um, it's It was very advantageous because I can be there. Otherwise, to raise point, we were planning on a five-hour uh, day to uh, deal with the traffic, the parking, and coming back. So as a caregiver, it allows that flexibility to participate, especially if you have to work outside the home. Sure, that's great. Uh, let's bring in uh, 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 Dr. Ramsey uh, uh, Falconer. Uh, Drew, Dr. Falconer, Drew Falconer. Can you talk about? Uh, sorry, Drew. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Falconer. Oh, it's all good. Uh, can, I, can you I talk haven't about, been Ramsey uh, since I was about six. Well, you know, you're <laughs> uh, you're not in trouble. What goes okay? around comes around. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Dr. Drew Falconer, <laughs> hey, tell us tell us about your experiences with telehealth and how how. Uh, how how you see the benefits? Uh, yeah, telehealth is is really has really just allowed us to make um, accessibility to specialty care such as Parkinson's specialty care much more available to folks. And Ray and his, his wonderful wife mentioned it. Um, it is a journey for patients to see somebody like us and we, we know as a community of, of Parkinson specialists and people who, who live who live around that that bubble of people with Parkinson's that most people don't actually see a movement disorder specialist to lead their care for their Parkinson's disease I think the best data we have is only about 26 percent of patients with Parkinson's will see a specialist in Parkinson's disease in the US alone we're dealing with a million people as of today who are living every day with Parkinson's so 26% isn't all that much, right? There are, there are a whole lot of people out there that don't have a member of their team be someone who does Parkinson's disease every day. And one of the biggest barriers that we've seen that keeps people from specialty care is exactly like Ray mentioned. There aren't a lot of us who specialize in what we do, and we tend to be kind of scattered around the U.S. in places that make us very un inaccessible. I mean, there's a big study I remember from pre-pandemic times it was a Medicare study that looked at people who traveled outside of their hospital's referring area for care. And in, in the Medicare population, which again is above 65, about 20% of all, all Medicare patients travel outside of their main hospital system for care. And guess what the number one condition that made people travel outside of their care? It's actually Parkinson's disease. And in fact, that same study showed that Parkinson's patients with Medicare traveled on average across the U.S. about 148 miles to get to specialty care. Well, that's crazy. That's insane. That, that takes a lot of people and makes accessing a specialist just completely inaccessible. Because coming to see us involves getting ready for a lot of patients, getting someone to bring them, getting their kids to take off, their neighbor to drive in. They fight traffic. They're in the car forever. They show up to clinic. They have to walk up to clinic wait in the waiting room, we're always running behind for a clinical visit, and then do it all in reverse, right? That yeah. is a burden of distance, travel, and time that for a lot of patients makes us inaccessible. And well, telehealth- and there's, there's the other symptoms that. too, like a lot of us uh, with Parkinson's, if we're uh, riding in a car, we get the anxiety and we oh, yeah. you know, we get nervous. And this, it brings on the other, it triggers some of the other symptoms. So uh, yeah, I can see it, how pressure. that would, uh, yeah. Uh, so, Doctor, uh, um, uh, I uh, I want to bring in now Doctor Martin. He, he uh, Doctor Ram uh, Faulkner mentioned it's like a, over 140 miles round tri round trip for the uh, for most people, but it, that actually can be a lot farther if you're rural. How does telehealth uh, help those folks that are like maybe even a day away from from seeing an MDS? Yeah. I think, I mean, I think it's really important. I think, you know, certainly for people who live in areas where they don't have access to you know, movement disorder specialist, or in some cases, even a neurologist. Um, I mean, I, have, I would have patients that would travel, you know, many hours, have to stay the night in a hotel, you know, see us the next day and then do it all again. So I think this really gives people who live in areas um, that are rural or sometimes even what we call medical deserts where they don't have access to this, it all of a sudden opens up a whole world of access to specialists um, that can really help with their care. And, you know, I think it's important, it, it, you know, as Drew mentioned, I think it's important that it's, you know, it's not just people that are far away, but, you know, people who 
you know, don't want to, don't, you know, can't deal with the traffic that's in the area. I mean, I had patients who would travel, would rather drive, you know, double the distance um, sort of outside of Atlanta to not have to deal with the traffic versus, um, you know, coming through Atlanta traffic to get to things. And it allows family members that are working or even patients that are working to be able to cut down their appointment times or maybe family members who live in other areas to be able to be involved in the visits as well. Yeah, I find that, that as, a, as a person with Parkinson's who works full time, it was really beneficial for me to have the telehealth because it wasn't such a disruption of my day. I didn't have to take a half day to, to go see my neurologist. It was really just another hour of my, of right. my day. It was, it was and, really convenient. And for what it's worth, I you know, for, for those of us who are able to see patients at home, there's a lot you can tell by somebody, um, you know, how they were at home. Um, without getting into too much detail, I had one patient who kept falling and we couldn't figure out why because he always looked good in clinic. Didn't matter what time of day it was or where he was in his medication cycle and he did fine with PT, but I saw him at home and all of a sudden I realized, you know, there's all kinds of stuff in the way and there's boxes and his cat's weaving in and out of his feet. And, you know, it really took me being able to see him at home to realize, you know, there's there's a multiple factors that were affecting his balance at home that we just weren't reproducing in clinic, so. Um, uh Dr. Faulkner, if, if somebody, uh, this is a question from the audience, if somebody does telehealth, how do you do tests with them? Yeah, it's it's been a crash course for us that didn't do telehealth prior to the pandemic, but it, it really, it reminded me that you can see a lot and you can test a lot without actually laying hands. The um, it, Look, are you, you still talk to a lot of docs who say, I have to touch patients to know what their tone is and their tightness and how their mobility is. But in reality, we can, we can see how your mobility is. We can see how your dexterity is, how your tone is, simply by having you do all those exercises we do in clinic, the open close, the tapping, rapid movement. But the biggest one is gait. Watching somebody get up and walk down the hallway and walk back gives me so much information about how your tone is, how your cadence is, the safety of your gait. And it, 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 it gives me all that info just through visual that really, in my opinion, seeing still a lot of people in person gives me the exact same markers that I need to make changes. But also remember, I mean, Parkinson's disease, we're treating the patient, right? We're not treating the gait, we're not treating the tone, we're treating you. And so just talking to somebody about the cadence of their day, the limitations in their day, the things that you're choosing not to do or do because of or despite of your Parkinson's disease, that conversation has really, because of telehealth, moved more to the forefront. And I think it's made us start to really hone in on fixing the subjective things in your day that are holding you back instead of focusing so much on tremor and tone that we see clinically. And so because you know, that, it's just shifted our conversations where we get people better. That's a great point. And I don't think it's uh, emphasized enough is that this isn't like uh, you get diagnosed with cancer and there's three possible treatments. Everybody's Parkinson's is different. And so it's important that the patient and doctor have that conversation so they can make sure that you're living the best life you can with as few obstacles as, as possible and they can eliminate or at least treat uh, uh, some of those more severe symptoms as they pop up over the years. Um, and it, it's that conversation that matters the most because there's no guy that's going to tell you Larry Gifford's Parkinson's diagnosis yeah. and treatment schedule. <laughs> like yeah. you and I are both in right. the dark until tomorrow, about, right? Yeah, real quick about that. Yeah, you don't have a manual. You're not. A, you, there's not a car manual that says 35 PSI in each tire, right? Then it would be right. too easy. Don't forget, folks, in the, in the U.S. right now, we have 23 medications that we can use to try to adapt and adjust to fix the issues that you're having in your day. We have four pieces of technology that are magical. But that all takes treating every person as a unique person and adapting based on how they do. And that's a big point that I wanted to make about telehealth. This is not something that replaces an in-person visit. It's not designed to replace it. It's a tool. It's an outlet that breaks that barrier of access. And it works beautifully, especially in the patients we have to fit in quickly. Because the old way of, oh, you call up and something's going wrong or you're having a side effect or there's a problem, the old way was, here, talk to my scheduler. Let's try to fit you in in a way that fits with your schedule and mine, given all of those logistical challenges of clinic. Well, now it's, hey, let's just do a telehealth visit before clinic tomorrow. Can you jump on at 830? We'll do a quick visit, see what's going on. It makes 
follow-up so much easier in our world too. Dr. Martin, do you, do you see that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to note too, you know, so much of the decisions that we make as far as treatments and care is not dependent on just that moment in time that we're examining you in clinic, right? It's, it's how have you been doing for the last several months? You know, how are you doing when you wake up in the morning? How do you feel at the end of the day? So it's a lot of it is really just, um, you know, getting information about how you've been doing. And so that's, that's going to be the same, whether it's telehealth or in person. Uh, Ray, how did you find your, t you never done, did telehealth before. How did you find out that you could do telehealth? And where, did you have to go to a different ne neurologist or were you, were you able to say, keep going to your same MDS? I actually, my motion disorders, I went, started off directly with the motion disorder specialist and telehealth was an option. I actually was a managing director for the Epilepsy Foundation here in Chicago. And we actually use telehealth in our offices. We're located in Crystal Lake, Illinois, which was a rural. And so we had individuals with epilepsy who either children or parents couldn't travel. And so I had experience with the, the telehealth from the very beginning. So when I saw with COVID, it became more prevalent. It was always an option, but it became much more prevalent for you. That's great. And I That's think one thing, uh, I'm sorry. Um, ahead, my observation too was when you have a telehealth, you know, uh, 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 something scheduled, it starts on time. So you're not in the waiting room uh, for a long time. I think it that, you know, even if it's for 15 minutes, starting on time and ending on time is uh, very, it means a lot. It's, it's, uh, it, it's very convenient and very efficient. That's great. Thank you for adding that. That's important too. Yeah, you do feel more respected, right? You know, that you're not just hanging around wondering when they're going to come through those double doors. Um, question for the doctors: How does somebody find a telehealth provider? Well, so, Dr. Martin, do you, you you do this more in an almost exclusive sense. How, how would people find you? Like, what's the path? So, I mean, I, I think there's there's multiple ways to do it. Um, certainly, word of mouth is one way. Talking to your current, you know, whoever you're 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 getting care from now, they may you know they may provide that option, and they may know somebody that does. Your primary care doctor may know as well. Um, you know, looking online, lots of patient um, uh, groups will you know have people that know who in your specifically in your area provides telemedicine. Um, I don't know that there's one central resource that would give you that information. Um, but I think, uh, you know, a, a, there's a lot of a lot of resources that are available to try to find that information. Well, it, it, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's you, uh, the best option is to start with your current physician or your current neurologist, current MDS, and just ask them if they have that available. And if they don't, can they recommend somebody? Um, you know, the, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has been really advocating Congress to extend the COVID-19 uh, telehealth flexibilities uh, because uh, they really help people with Parkinson's overcome the barriers to receiving care from specialists who understand their disease and treatments, especially through this new COVID, uh, the COVID-19. We found out last Friday, those have been extended for another 90 days, so that's good news, yay. Um, I, I, I wanna talk to Dr. Faulkner uh, when we get back about a study that he participated in, or you know, that he, he was the principal investigator of. Uh, but first, I wanna tell you about PPRI. Uh, PPMI, rather. <laughs> I'm going to get fired from this job. Uh, so the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, landmark study, uh, PPMI, uh, is uh, the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, also known as PPMI. We are recruiting volunteers right now. Uh, so listen to me closely. PPMI aims to change everything about how Parkinson's is diagnosed, treated, and potentially prevented. And you can help. People with recently diagnosed with Parkinson's play a critical role. Uh, click the link in the resource list to learn more about it. The online part of PPMI is open to everyone. Whether you have Parkinson's or not, go there. Anyone over the 18 living in the United States, PPMI online. You can get started in the study today, today, by clicking the Get Started button in the Take Action box on the bottom right of your screen right now. Again, it's PPMI. Uh, and uh, there's more on it at the MichaelJFox.org. Um, so let's let's get into this study a little bit, uh, Dr. Faulkner. 
here's what I have on it, and then you you can fill in some of the gaps or give me some context here. Um, a new study from a Nova Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center in Virginia, that's where you are uh, in, in, in practice, explains that telehealth enabled nearly all their new Parkinson's patients seen via telehealth to meet with a movement disorder specialist for the very first time. Really? Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, the, the study came about um, really because with the pandemic, we were all essentially had a forced use case experiment in telehealth, right? We all shifted heavily to it because we wanted to still, of course, maintain our patients and continue to do our jobs despite that whole you know global pandemic thing. Um, and what we realized at our center, so at the time we had three movement specialists, um, that within the first nine months of the pandemic, we actually saw as a group of three, almost 1,100 new patients. That's 1,100 new patients. And we thought, holy cow, Wow, that is a, I mean, that's a lot of people, right? That's much higher in, in, of a, a new patient referral base than I think anybody could consider because it's crazy. But when we looked at it, we realized that about 85% of those new patients were, were through telehealth. And of the patients who saw us for the first time through telehealth, almost 100%, so 97% of them had never seen a movement disorder specialist before. That's and so what it told us was... Oh, okay, this, this use case scenario, this, okay, now we're going to open the floodgates to making ourselves available electronically, right? That it seems to have allowed us to be accessible to a whole host of, of folks that otherwise distance travel and time would have made it just not an option. It was incredibly inspirational to us because it realized the, the potential for what's out there. Yeah, that's that's really remarkable. Dr. Martin, there's, there's some questions in the Q&A about what happens if I want to see a neurologist out of my state? There's some state laws and border issues. Are those being resolved or worked on, or how do you go about managing that? Yeah, so it's a work in progress. The current law is that the physician that you're seeing has to be licensed in the state in which you are located. So not where the physician is, but where the, pers the patient or the person seeing the physician is located. So um, you know, that, that can certainly make it difficult for us to see people across multiple states. Um, some of us have multiple state licenses. There is a, what we call an interstate um, medical licensure compact, which is making that easier for physicians to, to obtain more licenses. Um, but it's certainly still a barrier. It's still you know, something that we're certainly advocating for to try to, to ease those uh, restrictions and those barriers to allow us to provide care across the board. And then there's the country barriers, too. Is there's some questions about, is it available outside the U.S.? I know it's available in Canada, uh, and mm -hmm. I believe it's available in the U.K., uh, or at least parts of the U.K. Uh, are you aware of anywhere else that it's uh, being utilized right now? Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's multiple countries where it's available, so you really have to look at resources within each country and the restrictions as far as who can practice. You know, like, let's say I wanted to see somebody, I think somebody mentioned they were in Colombia, um, if I wanted to see somebody in Colombia, it, it depends on what restrictions are, are available there uh, or, you know, what are, what's in place there as far as, you know, can I practice across uh, country borders? So it's, it's very, very country specific when it comes to that. Um, but starting with your local resources, um, the Latin American, you know, movement disorder societies, things like that might provide more information for um, Central and South America. There's certainly similar organizations, um, you know, in Europe and Asia as well. But Larry, if Thank I could you. add, everyone on this yeah. call should call their senator, their congressman, and let them know that this is a priority and that it needs to get fixed. I mean, just a quick example. I'm here in north, sunny, beautiful, 100-degree northern Virginia. Washington, <laughs> D.C. is 10 minutes that way. Maryland is 15 minutes that way. If you're a patient of mine and you're in Roanoke, Virginia, five hours that way, we can do telehealth. But if you're in yeah. D.C., 10 minutes that way, or Maryland, 15 that way, we can't. It's nonsensical. It's crazy. It is a yeah. major barrier to accessing specialty care in, in, in our world and across the world of medicine. But the only people who can fix it is really honestly Congress because they hold that power. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to move on now a little bit away from the borders, the border issues. We don't we <laughs> and move towards how do we make the most of a virtual appointment? I'm going to start with Ray and Gail. You talk about the importance that the doctors now are showing up on time. When they show up on time, how do you prepare to make the most of that 15 or 30 minutes that you have with them? That's a great question. And uh, one of the things that I do, I approach it like it's a regular doctor's visit. So I have my notes, any comments or things I want to ask 
the doctor with me ahead of time, my medications as well, just to, you know, sometimes I'll forget what I'm taking, how I'm taking it. It's much more helpful to have it with me. I also stage the room. As Dr. Faulkner had said, gate is very important. If you put a computer like I've got in front of me right now, it's going to be hard for him to see me. So at home, I position the computer and such so you can see me doing the gates and, 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 and such. And also, the software that's used, the, there's different types of software. You always want to test it out before your first appointment because some of them don't really work on mobile devices. Some of them need to be in Chrome. So do your research before your appointment to make sure you can connect correctly. That's great. I know there's parts of uh, rural uh, British Columbia where I live where they actually have centers that people can go to where they set up the room for you and then they, they dial in direct, direct to your doctor. So it's like a, a virtual health center that you go to where they do all that technology stuff, especially for people that are older with Parkinson's. Uh, doctors, how do you uh, explain, what do you, what, what do you suggest? Go ahead. I was just going to mention that here at NeuroBalance, it's a topic of discussion that just came up that we're going to be asking our client base if it would be helpful for us to be able to stage telehealth at our facility because we were seeing that there's individuals either with, especially when you have motor disabilities, you know, typing, getting the computer, setting yourself up. That's something that we're actually researching right now to possibly implement in the next quarter. Oh, that's great. Uh, doctors, what do you suggest uh, for people to do uh, both from a from the personal, like the medical standpoint, but also from a technological, technological standpoint? How do they prepare for a virtual appointment? Dr. Dr. Faulkner, Martin, you want to start? start on, no, okay, I'll start on this one. So, yeah, go for um, <laughs> there's obviously some points that are here, you know, confirming your insurance coverage, what costs would be associated with that. Um, and as Ray already mentioned, just prepare as you would for your regular visit, have your questions, um, having a family member or loved one that's available with you is always helpful, um, especially for some of the testing. Sometimes it might be nice to have somebody close by, um, especially if there's any issues with balance, um, testing the technology. We've kind of talked about a lot of these things. And I would say too, you know, just um, kind of standard etiquette, um, just as you would for any other visit. So we, you know, request that you don't do a visit while you're driving a car or even a passenger in a car if, if possible. Um, dress as you normally would in public. Um, we prefer not to be in the bedroom or um, while you're watching TV and things like that. And um, specifically for Parkinson's, you know, it may be when you're testing your technology ahead of time, sometimes if voice is soft, it may be helpful to have a microphone that you can put closer to your mouth as well. Well, that's great. Dr. Faulkner, yeah. any other uh, suggestions? Yeah. Yeah, I think it it is a great opportunity to not just say how we make telehealth visits more effective for you, but also how we can make just clinical visits more effective. Same same ideas. And all of these things carry through, in my opinion, from in-person to telehealth. And the biggest one that we see is the best helper in terms of getting people better faster is number one, two, three on the list. You gotta have somebody mm -hmm. with you. Please, please, please never go to a clinical visit or have a telehealth visit alone. I don't know if we all realize it yet, but the people around us know a lot more about us than we know about ourselves. I've been married for 10 years. My wife knows everything about me, and rightfully so. Um, it's really important that your loved one, your neighbor, the person who sits next to you at church, who sits at the bar with you at the Elks Club, whoever it is that's in your life, walking your daily journey with Parkinson's, make them part of your clinical visit because we get you better faster. And then the other big one is I tell folks, make a list. Please make a list. Write down the things you wanna talk about. Write down the things that you wish you could do that you can't, the things that you're choosing not to do because of your Parkinson's. Write that down and in person, hand it to the doctor at the beginning and through virtual, send them a message ahead of time with that list. It is so, so have a guideline of what we need to talk about that matters to you and a guideline on where to even go. It saves us from that like first 15 minutes of pulling teeth trying to figure out where we need to go today, put it in a list, send it to us ahead of time, it helps. So um, I saw uh, one of the comments in Finland, they have select pharmacies that have set up these telehealth uh, centers where people can go and do their telehealth, which is really, really uh, a neat way to do it as well. 
Um, so it, there's lots of different options out there, and there's certainly not a solution for everybody at this point because um, it is a global issue, and not not every country, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> not every country is uh, built the same way with the same infrastructure and has the same uh, same medicines or, or facilities available, but or technology. So. Uh, hopefully over the course of time, it'll, it'll catch on worldwide and, and maybe soon you'll be seeing people all over the world. That would be amazing. Um, what, what has been the impact of telehealth over the course of the last couple of years on, on, on research and care of people with Parkinson's? Have we seen an increase, a decrease? Have we seen it? How has it changed? Uh, maybe we'll start with Dr. Falconer and then, yeah, then go to Dr. Martin on that. Yeah, so we're a research center. It's part of that whole Parkinson's Center mantra that we all tend to espouse here at Anova Health System. Um, I think we are currently running either nine or 10 clinical trials in the Parkinson's space, which is really fun. It gives us a lot of opportunities with folks. Um, but the last three years have been a real mixed bag. It, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of the research trials were very hesitant to use telehealth as an option um, for all the reasons in research that we like to keep things very regimented and controlled. Um, and so we had an incredible drop off in our clinical research participation. We had a number of studies even just cancel and postpone because patients didn't want to come to clinic and let alone a research study where you have to come once a month to do research things. Um, obviously, as someone also living through the pandemic, I get it. Um, it's only been about the past year to two years, maybe year and a half that companies running research trials have started to get on board with telehealth and realize that a lot of what we can do, we can do very effectively through these means. And those studies that really lean on a telehealth option have seen this just this huge uptick in enrollment because it's easy. Nothing wrong with that. Dr. Martin? Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, you know, there's there's been studies to show that evaluations comparing, you know, in-person evaluation versus virtual evaluations show that we are able to do these same things, we're able to confirm the same diagnoses. Um, and, you know, patients that are doing these things often find that um, you know, telemedicine is just as good as, if, you know, if not better than, than some of the inpatient visits. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about a lot of, a lot of studies, you know, either having a virtual component or some of them are completely virtual now, is that it really allows you to have access to trials that are outside of your driving distance, right? It's not just whatever your institution is running. It, it allows you access to a lot of those things now. It really opens up the the doors to um, you know, kind of removing that bias of not just you know when we do studies you know sometimes you have just a bias because you're only pulling people from your particular area so really opening that door can make a big difference. Yeah, it, it is easier to do to participate in research. You know, I was I was trying to do trials and stuff earlier on, but now I've, I've probably participated in three or four different uh, research projects just sitting here at my desk, which okay. which. I feel like it, at least I'm I'm starting down that path of because I want I want to participate in that process and when you work full time and it, 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 there's a lot of barriers in your way of participating and this makes it so much easier. Um, and I think it's Ray and, and, oh go ahead. I was just going to make one comment. I think it's important too because I ha you know I have a lot of patients that say well I'm, I will travel anywhere we'll go anywhere we need to go we'll do whatever and that's great. But, you know, a lot of times that travel impacts your Parkinson's disease. If you're going across time zones, maybe your, you know, your, your symptom control is not as, as good as it would be, or maybe you're more fatigued, that affects your scores in the trial. So, you know, in, in sort of roundabout ways, it can actually affect the results of the trial as well. So, again, being able sure. to see you in your environment, you know, without all of this, this excess travel can be helpful. Uh, question here from the audience on, does this cost more or less the same? As, a, as an in-person visit? It's, right now it's on par. So the, and that's part of that, that emergency that's been extended why all of us that do telehealth are really excited about it. Um, it's a parity law. So if I, on the billing side, if you see me in person, the way billing is put through your insurance is the exact same if we do it through telehealth, just with a certain modifier that we add to let the insurance company know that it's through telehealth. Copay, on down, deductible, all that, it's all under in, in person. Is that correct, Dr. And, Martin? Yep, yep, so, and, and I think it's- Medicare it's, covers it as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think it's an important thing that, you know, while the, 
this, the pandemic status is continuing to be extended, you know, that will continue. But I think it's important for us to advocate now, um, again, to, to Senate, to Congress about the need for this to continue long term, to not just be, you know, repeated 90 day extensions, but this is really the way we should do things going forward. Um, because we've proven that it's, it's, you know, it's beneficial, it's cost savings for patients. Um, so. Yeah, and, and if you're out there and you've never done a telehealth visit, try it. I find the people who are on the physician side, the docs who say I'll never do it are the ones that have never done it. And on the patient side, a lot of the folks who are reticent have never tried it. I can't tell you how many folks have come in for their, you know, once a year, let's just check in in person, and then in between we'll, we'll do telehealth. They come in in person, they're like, man, I hated that drive. I really, <laughs> I, I'm so excited to go back and do telehealth for our next few visits because that was miserable. Awesome. Right. Uh, it works. There's, there's people that are asking about um, what what how the, what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to say to their Congress people. I recommend you go to the MichaelJFox.org, click on Take Action, and it's the top thing there. It says Contact your 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 lawmaker, and it'll have all the language there that you can that you can that they can help you with that. So MichaelJFox.org, it's the Take Action button, and you'll see it there. Um, uh, who did I interrupt there? <laughs> Ray and Gail, uh, have you uh, participated in any uh, research uh, to, to, uh, with telehealth? Not with telehealth. I, I've done some other in person, but nothing with telehealth yet. Okay. Well, well here's a great opportunity for you and everybody else. Um, I, I do want to say uh, that you know telehealth visits help increase access to specialty care. And research shows it can be as effective as in-person uh, ones. Uh, and, and as a patient, I feel that too. In fact, I feel like I get more attention. I feel like I have the full focus of the doctor. There's not the there's nobody coming in saying, "Excuse me a second, I got to pull him away," or you know. And uh, so I feel like we're 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 locked in. Uh, specialists are able to confirm Parkinson's diagnosis via video conferencing. Uh, I think this. When this first started, there was questions around this part of it, whether you could diagnose mm -hmm. from telehealth. And, and that's been cleared up. Do you want to talk about that, Dr. Martin? Yeah, so you know, a lot of studies have been done to show that, that we are able to diagnose Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonism via telemedicine. You know, sometimes in the very, very early stages, there may be subtle things that we cannot pick up over telemedicine, but just like in person, you know, sometimes we have to wait a few visits before things really declare themselves, but this has been confirmed time and time again, showing that our ability to evaluate people in person versus, you know, via telehealth is, is similar. Great. The research also showing that there's improvements in depression and anxiety through the use of phone-based cognitive behavioral therapy. It works for me. <laughs> Somebody else also asked, is a, a, a voice therapy available through telehealth? I use it. So, yes, oh, I have an appointment right after this one. Uh, so, yes, that well, is available. Larry, if I could, if I could add ahead. something very quickly, I, I saw some questions pop up about diagnoses. Uh, remember, if out there, we are not as good as we think at diagnosing Parkinson's disease. There is a very big study from about circa 2014 um, that showed that even a clinical specialist like me who does this every day, we're wrong in our diagnoses about 15% of the time. That's a lot of people, right? It gets even worse when you go to general neurology and then internal medicine where a lot of folks get their primary diagnoses. It is such a subjective thing. For the most part, we diagnose Parkinson's by taking your symptoms, by taking your story, giving you medicine, and then saying, tell me how you feel. <laughs> Do you feel better, right? Do you look better? And if it's the home run ball of, wow, I feel like a million bucks, then we're pretty sure you got it. Don't forget, though, and some people have mentioned this in the chat, here in the U.S., we do have a test called DATSCAN, which is a type of PET imaging of the brain that, for the most part, tells us in color if you have Parkinson's disease. It is a picture of the dopamine circuit. It is fully covered by most, if not all, insurance providers, and it's been available in the U.S., FDA approved in 2010, 2010, 2011. So we've got 11 years of having a test that we can order that adds something objective to an otherwise subjective diagnosis. And I can tell you, we order them a whole lot with telehealth, because if you're kind of close and we're not sure, why not just order a DAT scan and then we can see for, see for ourselves? Yeah, that's the other thing. My doctor can still prescribe medic medicine. He can still prescribe testing at facilities. 
and I don't have to see him in order to do that. I just get a call from the testing center and they tell me where to go and I what date and I go and then they send him the results. I mean, it's, it's rather uh, efficient, frankly. Um, and then the, uh, the other impact of telehealth on research and care, online survey results uh, similar to assessments conducted at in-person studies. So uh, the, you know, we're, we're, we're finding that there's some parity there as far as how the patients are, are assessing themselves and how you know, they're filling out these surveys and whatnot. So that's great news. I mean, this is, this is sort of a whole new world. And so as we talk about advocating for this with your Congress people, it's really important uh, that we get out there. The other thing you can do is if you have questions, Michael J. Fox Foundation has a terrific policy team and you can email them directly, policy at michaeljfox.org, policy at michaeljfox.org. Um, Michael J. Fox Foundation supporting the, is supporting the At Home PD study, which asks study volunteers to complete virtual visits, smartphone activities, and online studies after completion of clinical trials to understand telehealth outcomes and conduct remote follow-up. So it's, you know, even the, the Michael J. Fox Foundation is involved in really trying to make the most of, of the telehealth situation. Uh, there, there's also, and they've, and they've been doing online surveys for a long time. And so if, you, if you've not signed up for uh, Fox Insight, for instance, that's just a quarterly questionnaire that they send out that you can fill out from the comfort of your home. And it's adding a tremendous amount of information and data to what we know about uh, Parkinson's disease and how it develops. Um, I'm just going to ask this. We were talking about how great it is. Are there any downfalls to, to, to telehealth? Have you, have, you, have you found anything where you're like, oh, that's, that's just one thing that's just not quite as good? Yeah, absolutely. I, it is common, but not the norm, that we just get people who we can't connect. The technology just isn't working at that moment. They, there's an update that needs to be run, a download, you name it. And it got made a lot harder in, in the world of a lot of us docs because we we all Zoomed for a long time. Everybody knows how to do Zoom, right? Um, well, Zoom is not, an, not a HIPAA-compliant platform. It's not something that technically you can do within the bounds of, of being secure enough for HIPAA. So our system had to move away from using Zoom. And once you have like three or four different platforms, that just gets more confusing for patients. So I think the biggest limitation is that we just sometimes have people where we just say, forget it, let's just do a phone call and talk, and then we'll work to get you in in person. All right, so there's a lot of questions about DAT scan here. Uh, and, they, and do we factor in alpha synuclein and you know, the dopamine CAT scan, they're calling it? So let's get some more clarity on the DAT scan and what it is and what it measures and how you can tell if somebody has Parkinson's. Yeah, it's a, it's a type of PET scan. And it takes a picture of the dopamine transporters in the brain. So it's taking a picture of that dopamine system. And we tend to report accuracy. Someone asked about accuracy. Uh, in our world of testing, we think about what's called sensitivity and specificity. And for DATSCAN, they're both over 98%. So if it's glaringly positive, then you're in the ballpark of Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism. Yeah, and I think right. it's important. It's ideal to get them done or at least interpreted by um, an institution or by a physician that has experience with these because there are nuances in, in interpreting it. And it, it doesn't necessarily say 100% that you have Parkinson's disease, but that you have one of the Parkinsonian syndromes. So there are some atypical syndromes that would still be abnormal on this scan. So it doesn't necessarily help us um, specifically with Parkinson's itself, but it certainly puts us in that ballpark of one of those Parkinsonian syndromes. And in reality, it takes after diagnosis, maybe even a couple of years to figure that out, even you know, right. without right. a doubt. Even in person. Yeah, even in person. Yeah. Right. Uh, Ray and Gail, what, uh, as far as telehealth, has it, has it impacted your, your, just your, your personal life uh, and how you go about doing your daily business? Does it, does it feel like, for me, for instance, uh, I'll just talk about myself without letting you react to it. It, it was always such a uh, a day oh it's the it's the doctor day and so then you get ready for that day and you're taking time away from work or, or family to go there your wife's coming with you she's got to cancel her stuff you know, you're dragging everything there it's a I mean, it's a go going across town you show up you wait in the lobby and stay out of the nurses and then you're waiting in the lobby and you're waiting in the lobby and you get back there and then you wait again for some other time and, and, and so for me it just felt like it was a blown day 
And, and, and now I feel like it's actually a very productive part of my day. And I, I feel like Parkinson's doesn't get in the way of me living my life where with those every six month appointments, it felt like it, my life just stopped for a day until I figured out if I was okay to continue living. <laughs> Well, Gail, Gail had actually you know, mentioned what I was saying in the traveling here in Chicago and such, and Dr. Faulkner is right. Whenever I show up, I make sure I'm at the hospital at least an hour beforehand so my blood pressure goes down from the commute because it's always bumper to bumper in. And it's even worse out. I think the other important thing was um, you can get an appointment quicker. Like I was put on a medication that had a definite neurological deficit impact on me, which I could tell, I felt like my IQ was just plummeting. Gail noticed it and I was able to have a telehealth where the doctor uh, had me do the Montreal test and she thought I was joking and I wasn't. And from that I was able to transition to a neuropsychologist that said, take him off this one medication and it all reversed. So having the, the ability to have a speedy appointment is really important. That's great. That's, that's terrific. Um, I, I want to take some more questions from the audience here. Um, it, it, like there's somebody asked about why, back to that skin, why maybe their doctor won't order one. I know in Canada, they don't do the that scan at all. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a very, a, you, the U.S. uses it a lot. Uh, where else is the that scan utilized, and, and why would maybe a doctor not think it's appropriate for a patient? So I would say, you know, I typically only order it if if I'm not sure, right? If there's not a clear signs of some sort of Parkinsonism, um, or if there's other other things that might be going on. So if maybe somebody's on a medication that causes symptoms that look like Parkinson's, or Maybe they have, they've had strokes in the same area or some other injuries that are in the same area that really muddy the water, then the, I think that scan is really helpful in those situations. But I think in, in most clear cut cases, especially if you've somebody's tried medication and it's clearly been effective, then the DAT scan is not going to add anything extra to our, you know, it's not going to change our treatment at all. Right. Then that's it's, how I was just an objective test. They gave you a dope, but it worked. <laughs> yeah. Then you're good. It, it's just a, it's a picture, right? If you go to a doctor right. and they say, you know, my leg doesn't work and I can't walk anymore, we know it's spinal. And so we have to do an MRI of the spine to see what kind of issues are there, right? Or if you're worried about a stroke, you have to take a picture of the brain to see what the stroke looks like. That's a has to. A DET scan is not a has to. It's just a tool. It's an objective picture that can help when things aren't clear cut. The so maybe that, that doctor I, is just very confident. The people that That's I great. know at the center that I've actually done boxing and such, that have had that scan are the individuals that don't have the tremor or the mm -hmm. certain features, but they do have Parkinson's. And so it seems like the that scan really was helpful because if you don't have the tremors, then it's hard when you're on carpidopa, levodopa to see that off and on time issues. And so those are the individuals I've heard that have had the scans here. If, uh, if you, Project into the future, five years from now, uh, with with telehealth. Do you see them using more smart devices and the watch trackers and more technology as part of the the overall? Because listen, you get me, you know, twice a year for fifteen minutes. You don't know my Parkinson's as well as I know my Parkinson's. So so those technologies could probably really bring some insights to you understanding sort of the ups and downs of your patients and sort of the flow of their their Parkinson's symptoms. Is there any talk about that? Do you see that happening? Yeah, I, I mean, I think... Oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Rick. I was part of a study initially, I believe it was Safe Biometrics out of Washington State, where you're using your cell phone, and it's actually registering if you're tremoring and such. And they're trying to, I think, develop the ability to use your iWatch or mm -hmm. the Apple Watch and such to track that information as well. And I think that would be great. And I think that if there was some way to do also tie in telehealth with just at home, some kind of device that would be able to take your blood pressure and other information like blood sampling and such so that we could provide that information before the telehealth visit 
for the doctor to review would be helpful as well. Yeah. Go and ahead, go ahead Doug, uh, Go ahead, Larry. Dr. Martin. Okay. So there's a lot of research in this area looking at different types of wearables and, and really trying to find what we call passive ways of collecting information. So not necessarily something where you go into an app and do something, but that it just passively measures tremors, you know, gait, your walking speed, falls, things like that. Um, but it's it's a it's a giant amount of data that comes in. And so trying to figure out how to interpret that data and make sure it really that we're measuring what we think we're measuring um, is, is a, I think one of the biggest barriers right now is to, to be able to put that into an, an sort of an interpretable, um, uh, you know, uh, measure that we can actually use to make, you know, benefits for our patients this is the biggest issue right now. Dr. Faulkner. I, that was, I couldn't put it better than that. It's, it's all about the right amount of data about the right thing without being data overloaded. Cause if we're already 30 minutes into a 20 minute visit talking about constipation and sleep issues and muscle cramping and toe curling and motor fluctuations. And the reason why you didn't go to your daughter's ballet recital three weeks ago, um, when are we gonna have time for the, the book of, here's four months of my um, data off of my iWatch, right? And that's what right. I think there's a lot of movement in a lot of the, the companies that are creating these devices are trying to do is find a way to highlight their info in ways that is, allows for quick digestion by the doc and then implementation. It's hard. What what is um, when you talk when we talk about telehealth? Part of that is actually just a voice call that some doctors are, are providing. Is there a different way or a better way to prep for a voice only call without video? Yes, schedule a telehealth or an in person visit soon after. <laughs> Um, I, we, we've tried, look, we are pushing the info. Dr. Martin might, might have a different opinion. Remember, we're all different, but I, I am the biggest proponent of telehealth you can imagine because of its ease of use, but I got to see it. I mean, it, I got to be able to see a move. I got to be able to see a walk. In reality, a phone visit is nothing more than the after clinic. You called me with a question. I mean, right. we can't do much over the phone with the, what we do. Dr. Martin, you agree? Or disagree. I agree. I think if it's a quick question, like I started taking this medication and I have this side effect, or, you know, when I saw you three months ago, my meds were lasting until the next dose, but I'm starting to find that, you know, 30 minutes before my next dose, I'm, I feel like I'm starting to wear off. I think easy things like that might be okay for a quick, but a quick, you know, phone check-in. Um, but we're really limited in what we can do as far as that goes without being able to see you and, um, you know, make recommendations based specifically on what we see, especially when it comes to something like, I changed the dose of my medication and now I'm having this funny movement. Um, because we don't know, is it, is it too much medication? Is it a side effect of the medication? Is it not enough? So when it comes to specific movement issues, we, we, we just have to lay eyes on it. Great. Ray, I wanna ask you a question. Um, when you're going through a telehealth uh, session, what, what are some of the things that the doctor asks you to do in order to evaluate your movement progression? Um, it's pretty much the same as what you're doing at the doctor's office. The gait, the finger tapping, hands to the nose, everything that you do at the doctor's office, you're doing it on, on telehealth. There's no restriction. The only thing, like I said before, I would make a point of putting my computer in a position where she could watch me walk at least 20 feet forward and backwards and turn around and capture my whole body as opposed to just the upper body. I try to make it as close to the doctor's visit as possible. But everything the um, doctor does at the visit is the same. Dr. Martin, if you're a new person to, um, to, to, to an MDS, if, you, if you're a new patient, uh, you can, you've, you've mentioned you can diagnose people over telehealth, but how soon do you need to see somebody in person once that happens? Like, if the very first visit is telehealth, how soon after that do you want to actually lay some hands on them? I think, I mean, I think it really depends. I think it depends on the person. It depends on what symptoms they're having, how quickly things are progressing. Um, you know, if it's somebody that says, yeah, I have a little bit of tremor, it's not really bothersome, but just thought I should get it checked out that might be somebody I feel more comfortable waiting a longer period of time, or maybe see, checking in again in six months and saying, well, just check in, see how you're doing. 
you know, maybe they're not interested in medication at this point and it's not impairing their you know, daily activity, that's somebody I'd feel more comfortable waiting, doing another telemedicine visit maybe. If it's somebody that I'm more concerned that maybe there's something else going on, maybe it's a spinal cord issue, maybe it's, you know, there's other things obviously that can affect your movement, then that's somebody I would want to see more quickly. So it's, there, I don't think there's a set time. It's really just patient dependent. Yeah, and I think we're all back now. So I don't know if I froze or you froze, but here we are. Uh, I, I would say, yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting point that you made there. Uh, uh, and, and, and I think it's you know one of those things where you, you mentioned earlier how hard it is to diagnose Parkinson's, uh, Dr. Faulkner. And, and, it, and it's true. Like even, you know, at first they thought I might have MS, but so then I saw an MS neurologist. And then I went to a Parkinson's neurologist. And that's a short journey compared to a lot of people who may you know, if you're a young woman, it could take five, six years before they figure out, oh, she has Parkinson's because they don't go there first. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, I can see, you know, you, you're going to want to see somebody who's, uh, on the, if you're not sure where, which it is, you know, but what they actually have, you're going to want to see them in person before too awful long. You feel the same way, Dr. Faulkner? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, then again, I have patients who we have a fully virtual relationship and I have never met them in person. It, it's all very patient dependent. And if, if we make decisions clinically over telehealth and you're good, then you're good, right? So at the end of the day, lean on your doctor. And if a doctor says, about, hey, we really should do the next follow-up in person, do that. Yeah. What about rehabilitation visits? Are they available virtually? Where we are, they are. Yeah, especially speech therapy. That's an, that's an easy one. Uh, even physical therapy. Look, I, I, you, you have every center in the in the U.S., every advocacy group is doing all kinds of exercise through telehealth still, through Zoom and all the other platforms. Uh, rehab services do too. That's great. Um, are you both seeing your doctors virtually? I have. I'm sure you have a family doctor, a physician, right? You know? Uh, I moved east of Atlanta. My physician is northwest of Atlanta. So if I don't have to travel all the way across or around, then absolutely I see her as often as I can via telemed. And That's I have great. to plan the whole day around it if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, you get it. Uh, Dr. Yep. Faulkner, same? Uh, well, I'm lucky that the primary care clinic that I go to is right next door. So, and they all know us. <laughs> nice. I mean, we're all, I've been here for eight years. We all know each other. So I just run over for my clinical visits. All right. Well, uh, we, we're running out of time here. Here's the last question. When there is some time between visits, is it helpful to prepare and send meds lists and synopsis of questions and summary of experience uh, in the doctor's portal prior to the visit? Please. Yeah. It's very helpful. How, how long of a list is too long of a list? issues more, that you're having. more than half a page try to shorten it back single spaced because well just be honest with yourselves if you send us three pages single spaced that's going to be really hard to go completely through so trying to keep it i don't want to say reasonable because that's a subjective term but just if you've got a top five things we can talk about that's a good place to try to start right yeah yeah and, and you should time, order them in the how, how how would you have them order them most important to, at the top. Like the thing that's giving you the biggest issues today is keeping yep. you from living the life that you want to live, the way you want to live it comfortably or or, however, or if there's activities you want to do that you can't do or stuff like that, correct? Yeah, So Absolutely. what do you want to tackle now? And then we can just sort of peck down the list. Yep. Great. Absolutely. Uh, and sometimes, right? you know, there's some things that come up that things may be related to each other. So us knowing what your questions are ahead of time, we may be able to actually even combine some of those things or address one thing with, you know, or two things with the same treatment option, so. Right. Uh, Ray and Gail, any final words? Yeah, i just like to say, I think telehealth is a great way to enhance that uh, patient-doctor caregiver relationship. I think it's an important tool in the toolkit to especially get people that are in the rural area services. I believe in one of the conferences I was just at, uh, they were talking about, I don't know if it was Wyoming or a state out west that only has one motion disorder specialist. And again, as Dr. Faulkner said, if you're living on the border to another state, 
I think this, the state issue is very important to tackle. Okay, get the final word, Dr. Faulkner, then, then uh, to you, uh, uh, Dr. Martin. Well, my final word is a reminder that there's a lot of hope out there, that we are a different field, we are a different condition than we were even 10 years ago by treating Parkinson's disease every day. Uh, we have therapies today that were pipe dreams five years ago. There are, again, 23 options out there medication-wise, four pieces of technology, but greater than 90% of patients who live with Parkinson's have never touched anything but the original medicine from 1972. So just realize you are never at the end of the rope. You are never stuck in the alleyway without a way out. There are things we can do. There are things we can try. There are things we can implement to try to help every day in your life. But it starts with you. It starts with having the courage to be a self-advocate, to not be the good patient, and to go to your doctor and talk about the things that are holding you back. And telehealth has done nothing but allowed that process to be more accessible to all because now we can meet sitting in your living room instead of having you have, come on in. So just rem remember, Dr. there's a lot of hope out there, guys. You are a big fan of this, I can tell. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just right. a fan uh, of, of trying to reach people. That's all it is. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Dr. Martin, you're, you've got the final word today. So I 100% I echo what Dr. Falconer said, but I would also say that, you know, as patients, you have probably more power than we do as far as advocating for yourselves, especially when it comes to, um, you know, healthcare, you know, laws and regulations, you know, we can say a lot of things until we're blue in the face, but if you're sitting in front of your congressperson or your senator and they see the struggles that you're having and they hear about your personal struggles, it's going to make much more difference than anything we have to say. So please just try to reach out and, and make your voice heard. Thank you all for joining us today and being part of our community. And thanks to our panelists for sharing your time and expertise. We will be sending a link to the webinar on demand so you can listen again or share it if you'd like. We hope you found it very helpful and we wanna thank you for being here and have a great day. Great. It was a pleasure. Take care, bye-bye.